know, I grew up up here in this area and I was expecting a snowstorm, but that didn't happen. That was supposed to be funny. Okay. My name is David Gray, I work with the Lupin Apache tribe of Texas. I'm the linguist. I'm not a member of the tribe, but I'm an ex officio member. I can advise, but I don't get to vote. Uh, I work in linguistics. Uh, I work in Hispanic linguistics for the longest time. Worked with my two colleagues over here who seem to have some way of bringing people back all the time. And uh, I wanted to share you, with you the situation of the Lupin Apache tribe of Texas. It is unique and interesting. And there's so much going on. Um, I just wanted to basically say, um, I guess, metaphorically, we are petitioning for recognition. Um, we're in the process of the federal recognition process. There's a lot of federal hoops to jump through um, with uh, recent events over the last year and a half. Things are looking not so good either. Um, but we were recognized by the state of Texas uh, in March 18, 2009. So we have state recognition. We're just still working on federal recognition. We do not have a centralized set of land or property or anything like that. So what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is I'm going to show you guys some of my the Pine Patch of sources and the status of our language. Um, basically, we are. our status is classified as either as dormant or non-existent. We basically have no native speakers. So what's the situation that happens when you have no native speakers? Um, let's talk about that. So we're going to look at what's in the works, the dictionary. Uh, Linda Walking Woman, who was going to come but was not able to come, is working on a lot of pedagogical materials and our reconstruction strategy, which is going to Again, throw some very familiar names with you guys. So, uh, the Pond Apache is actually a member of the Athabascan languages. These are the Athabascan languages. Uh, there's their distributions. Uh, there's the Northern Athabascan languages. Uh, there's some along the West Coast. And then the Southern Athabascan languages, which comprise pretty much, um, well, one language that you've heard of, of course, Navajo. Um, so there's the Pacific Coast, Northern, and then the Apache languages, which are the Southern Athabasca languages, we've got uh, Kiowa, but then we've got Navajo, which kind of has Eastern and Western variants. The Pan Apache is classified with Hikaria as one of the um, Eastern variants. So the situation is, is that we've got the Pan, which is kind of basically has no speakers, but we have sister languages, Hikaria, and then we've got kind of cousin languages, Navajo, which is very well documented. So even though we don't have speakers, what could we do? Um, so there are various other languages. Chiricahua, which you've, I'm sure, heard of, if you've ever heard of Geronimo. Uh, Navajo, code talkers, World War II. Right? Yes. All right. So the idea is these languages are all mutually intelligible, but yet Navajo is a language, Chiricahua is a language, Mescaleto is a language. So the question is, um, when I first took the job as linguist, I'm believing the pace not that great. Uh, when I took the job as a linguist, my first suggestion is, well, okay, we're not existent. What if we were to take a sister language like Hikariya, learn that language, and then apply the pan as we know it? And then people would say, well, Hikariya is a completely different language, which is what people would say. So the idea is, is why would we use a completely different language when but what would that doesn't make sense. Now, the question is, is Hikaria really classified or Navajo as a different language because it is linguistically different or politically different? So uh, it's a long-standing kind of thing that when you talk about in linguistics is, well, what makes a language versus a dialect, right? You guys that have heard this, what makes a language versus a dialect, what does a language have? An army and a navy. So none of these guys have navies because they're all landlocked. So another joke. Okay, that failed. All right. <laughs> um, but if you consider, you know, the language definition doesn't even really hold true. We speak English. The British speak English poorly. But yet, they've got their own individual <laughs> armies and navies. Somebody, see, pay attention. <laughs> to say nothing about Spanish. So, what am I going to do? I'm going to show you my, uh, my ideas. Just, I pulled this from Wikipedia. I know that professors hate me. Don't pull Wikipedia. It's not that bad. But <laughs> some of the Athabascan languages, um, so I'm going to throw, where's the laser, there we go. If you look at 
this, this is the sound chart. So I'm proceeding on the assumption that Nippon, even though it's non existent, is going to be very similar to Navajo and all those other sister languages. Um, historically, uh, Nippon split from Hikaria about 150 years ago. They actually split off into two separate groups. Now, if you think about it, British English and American English split off about 300 years ago in terms of dialects. But if you look at this, I'm going to proceed on the assumption that Lipan is rather similar to the other southern Athabascan languages in that I'm going to expect to see a lot of these same sounds. Now, if you look up here, I know a lot of you guys aren't trained linguists, but one of the things that yeah, they're, they're missing B, Ds, and Gs. There are no voiced stops. But I'm going to expect that where I see maybe a T or a T or a CH in Navajo, would it be reasonable to expect to find that in Nippon also? And that's kind of what I'm looking at. Um, so what do we got? We got the consonants, um, fricatives are over here. We're going to take a look and see what can we do. Um, so they have aspirated consonants, unaspirated consonants. What on earth does that mean? So if I say the English word is an American taco, there's a little bit of breath of air that goes in there. Right? And did any of you guys ever take Spanish? So when they were telling you to take Spanish, you had to learn not to throw that breath of air, right? Because it's not taco, it's taco, right? So for us as English speakers, we'll aspirate a certain type of consonant at the beginning of the word Spanish won't. But two, a Navajo speaker, those taco, what words like aspirate one? Taco versus taco, two separate complete sounds. So I, so this is taco, it's just one set of like an angle, right? Except the taco. All right. But they've also got a lot of unvoiced consonants. And so I figured we'd have some fun. So, do me a favor. Pull out your vocal cords. There you go. So, say, feel that vibration? Yes. I'll say, vibration's gone, right? So, what we're going to see is that, um, the Southern Athabascan languages have uh, what they call a voiceless L. So, say ooh. Right. Now, remember how I just said don't. So, your, your, s, your z is a vibration. Your S doesn't have it. That's the only thing. Say an ooh, but don't vibrate your vocal cords like you did with an S. Mm -hmm. See how easy that is? So, say ooh, but just without the vibration. See how easy that is? <laughs> so, it, but what does it almost sound like? Got it. It's almost like No, I'm not, I'm not playing that game. No, it's a It's almost Yeah. And to somebody it might sound like a sh. Um, or the graphic concerns I was really made me really smile when I saw orthographic how um, the D's are used orthographically to represent unvoiced consonants that are not aspirated. If you look at like Patawatami versus Wadimik. If you notice the B versus the P, voice to unvoiced, the D's and the T's, very similar thing. Uh, anyway, vowel system, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, really quick, um, Alfred Swadesh, what was his name? Uh, linguistic survey. This is just a real comparison of some of the basic uh, 100 basic lexical terms. Like the word for I in Navajo is she, Chiricahua, she, Western Apache, she with a longer vowel. Just look at all the basic similarities. But my idea is, is similar to, and I don't want to sound going like I'm going all into European, but if Spanish were to disappear off the face of the earth, could we reconstruct Spanish if we know still Portuguese, Italian, French, Romanian, Latin, and how Spanish kind of evolved, even if we didn't have modern day Spanish. So we know, like in Italian, we've got the word forno. Could we really reconstruct the Spanish word orno for oven from forno? And that's the idea that I'm proceeding on. With all of these similarities, uh, so where are we going to go? Where can we go? We're going to go to the comparative list. So these are, these are my sources for the Pan Apache. There's not that many. I've got a list 
Uh, I've got some visual samples. Gachet, or Gatchet as they say. Um, he's got 72 pages of work that he did in the 1880s. We've got some work by, we've got 72 pages. We've got 66 pages. We've got um, some articles that are really dense linguistic articles by Harry Hoysier. 33 pages, three pages from a French guy. We've got maybe 110 pages of source. Uh, this is Gachet's, this is a picture literally of his work. Uh, he has a word on one side, English gloss, sometimes Spanish gloss, and then he's got his, uh, his sources John over here and Lewis over here. And that's what it looks like. It's handwritten. So can you imagine linguistic transcriptions that are handwritten in cursive? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, cursive is what it made me do. Um, <laughs> so, but if you look, his word, he transcribes his word for row as T and then a C with a super split and then OSH. And that's found right here. So I'm working with that word right there. And that says row. And I'm comparing it to Navajo. So there's our word for row from Navajo. So that's a T. That's a little L with a bar through it. That's the voiceless L. O, O, the accent marks. He kind of confused stress with tone. And then another L bar. So there to there. So we've got. Remember when we did that little stuff with the... So he's confusing his voiceless L with a SH sometimes, and sometimes with his CL. Yeah. So this is... Um, I have to look at these, and if you go through his data in all 72 pages, um, the Navajo, it's glottalized. Did Gachet miss glottalized consonants, and did he more or less miss L? The word finally, making it SH. Um, did he miss vowel length? Vowel length is phonemic in the other Athabascan languages. Long vowel versus short vowel um, makes a difference in a word. So that's some of my source. Uh, what, what I can still do is at least try to get some thing from this. Um, another example, he has a lot of body parts. Um, all of his body parts, they all begin with this little K before them. And cachet, um, Miss that you know that's body parts have to have possessors in some languages. It's called inalienable possession, but, but you just can't say armpit. It has to be my armpit, your armpit, his armpit. But just to give you an example, um, there's a Navajo word, kashta. That's still a T. Kashta with glottalized K, which corresponds that this K goes to right here. So kashta, kashta. So we've got that there. That there. Uh, how much faith do we put in Gachet's work? Um, I was even wondering was about his training. I contacted somebody from the Miami tribe who also worked with his work and like that. Hand writing is Gachet's for sure. Um, but just how the semantic extension armpit extends to poison or body odor. So like yeah, kosh versus kosh. So we got some similarities going on. Um, he missed the third person markers. Uh, nasal vowel, which is the little um, hooks down there. He's got sometimes marked with an end. How much faith can we put in Gachet's work? What's the system? Here we go with Gachet with rib. Um, his word for rib, there, O in the superscript, O to the nth power, nasalized vowel, but versus acha, uh, those little hooks are nasalization. Wild Morgan's atza. So we've got some stuff, you know, this looking like he was at least interviewing an Athabascan speaker. Um, he's got his possessive marker act, but again, do we know, is he consistent with his nasals? Sort of. Is he consistent with his long vowels? Not necessarily. And he's got a lot of dashes, and I don't know sometimes if his dashes are glottal stops. Um, but that is 72 pages. That's the bulk of my source for this language. Uh, Pliny Goddard has some coyote and wolf stories. If you're in linguists, gloss, 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 they'll start to look a little bit more familiar without morphing breakdowns. Um, he's still got the C's where those are Americanist 
TSs, right? So these are some more of the stories. Um, sometimes these things don't line up. So it's like Mba is the word for coyote, but some markers go on there to change some other things. A uh, good example of how it's an SOV, language subject, object, verb, or voice, which at the end. So this is another three-page source for my language. He marks his vowel long, vowels long, marks his aspirated consonants. Harry Hosier has some works Southern Athabascan languages. He's got like a five article series of the Apache languages. Um, the Swadesh list, there's a history of customs of the Lipan as told by Augustina Swasa, which is a long story. Um, I have a sample of that. Um, Lee for deer, coyote, went to visit him, so the deer went to visit the coyote. subject, the deer. He went to visit object, the coyote, subject, object, verb happening. So this is another source of my data. He printed, thankfully. Uh, there's some note cards found in the collections at Cornell University by, well, these, these ones are, I'm sorry, are from American Philosophical Society, the verb paradigms. Um, I think most of you guys have seen like those um, 501 Spanish verbs where they got all those conjugation tables on one page. Spanish is really simple. There's you know two maybe sets of endings. Your Athabascan verbs um, can have up to 14 prefixes. Subject agreement, object agreement, object agreement with type of object as well as person number, aspect markers, Continuity markers, tense markers, uh, headache markers, a lot of different verb <laughs> Verb prefixes. So this is uh, these are some just sort of verb prefixes that can happen in this language. I'm just going to skip through these because it's almost unintelligible. Uh, then we've got the Berlandier and Chol vocabulary, uh, which was written by a man from France that was traveling through. So thankfully, that guy got the nasal levels right. Um, he went through um, and did the language of the Lipans, and he did three pages, very thin paper. As you can see, that it even um, the paper bled through. So he's got um, Spanish word, French word, and then our Lipan words over here. And we've only got three pages of this. Um, and then I've got a book by Pimentel, and this circulates quite a bit, and it's supposed to be the Lord's Prayer. I've kind of got, where is it? Yata Seta for God, I really have not been able to make much sense of whether this is or is not the, uh, the Lord's Prayer in Nippon or not. This is circulated um, since I think 1830. Um, Morris Opler archives from Cornell University um, have a lot of really good transcriptions. So your bear, Prashash, Beaver, Cha, and he's marking um, his hive tones. Corn, which is really an interesting compound. The word for corn in the Athabascan languages. Southern Athabascan language is literally food of my enemy. Uh, these are just some of his note cards that I got. A lot of it is just scraps of paper that we were able to find. Um, we've got some stories, like Antonio Apache tells some of the cultural stories about when there are some dances happening. So what are we working on? We're working on a dictionary and some pedagogical materials. So I'm trying to put inside a spreadsheet all of the attested words on the spreadsheet. So I like to take some from each of my sources and then compare those to the Hikaria and Navajo words to start to say, is this word of Athabascan origin? Sort of like if I were to try to recreate the days of the week in Spanish, I pull Sunday, Monday, Tuesday from French, from Italian, but if I try to pull them from Portuguese, Portuguese uses the first day, second day, third day. So I would I would just try to find what I can get, what, am I getting Athabascan words or am I not getting Athabascan words? So I try to contrast the, um, once I've got those words, I can say, okay, so what are some systematic differences that Lipan might have, that Hikaria might not have, or Navajo might not have? And there are some 
consistent differences like some words with word initial K versus word initial T. There's a leveling that happens that some words have T's and K's, but another dialect just levels them all out to K's. So what can we do? We can try to make predictions about what the pond could or would have been, but we're still going to miss, oops, taboo words. We're going to miss legitimate borrowings. Um, and then verbal morphology is a whole other uh, question to deal with. But then the walking woman has created some pedagogical materials for children and for adults. She's living in Connecticut. And our ultimate goal, of course, is to revitalize our language. Um, so in revitalizing the language, Bernard Barsena, our chief, says, we need to learn to speak Apache, and the Lipan details can come later. So we are basically kind of using Hikariya language as a template, and then throwing in the Lipan words rather than Hikariya words as we know it. So uh, we're going to follow uh, Joshua Fishman's model of his eight stage models for reviving a language. Mm -hmm. And I just want to throw the first three at you because they're kind of relevant to us. Uh, Objective one, acquisition of the language by adults who affect, inspect language and act as language apprentices. Um, he just left, but he was working on that. How's exact, there you guys are exactly doing that. Um, creating a socially integrated population of active speakers of the language is exactly what you guys are doing. Uh, for the Apache tribe, which is very spread all across Texas, all the way to California. Um, encouraging the informal use of language among people of all age groups and bolstering its daily use through the uh, local neighborhood. Since we don't have a local neighborhood, we are trying to use the internet. Right? <laughs> and that's what we are trying to do. And that's how we are trying to do our revitalization, which is one of the seven components that the Bureau of Indian Affairs would really like to see in our recognition. That's it.